you about that. Uh, so good to see you this morning. I'm Dan Seitz. Uh, welcome to Hillside. In case you're wondering, we are uh, rounding third base on this series from First John that we started a couple of months ago. Believe it or not, this is week 13. And we've got a really great passage to look at this morning. Uh, I will say you are going to need a handout to follow along today. This message is kind of thick. So if you did not get a handout, I bet Mike Downing, who actually needs a handout himself, uh, <laughs> will bring a handout to you. But you'll, you, you'll want one. I hope you follow along. You know, as we've talked about all along the way, uh, the Apostle John's burning aim in his book was to supercharge love in his church. Well, if John's book is inspired scripture, it means something. It means that God's burning aim is supercharged love in our church, our church today. And there's your first fill in supercharged love, supercharged love here at Hillside is what God wants. God's desire is that whatever our love each other batting average is right now, that we would raise it by 50 points. And what's more, God's desire is that we would express that love through action. After all, the love that John is talking about through the book is the kind of love that Jesus our King exemplified. It's life laid down love or LLDL as we've been talking about. And LLDL means so much. First of all, it means showing up to church for each other, like you have this morning. Bravo. It means welcoming each other, seeing each other. It means seeing the best in each other. It means affirming each other, not assuming that whatever that person is doing at Hillside, that person just has to do but noticing it and appreciating it. It means forgiving each other because we bruise each other from time to time. It means second chancing each other. It means hosting each other for brunch. And you know what else it means? It means not ghosting each other, meaning not withdrawing from each other. You know, in his great book, if you read one book on the spiritual life in your life, you should make it Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. But in this book, he writes that people hiking together on the Christ-like quest, like all of us, and the people who are going to be gathering in this next hour, we all should be ruthless in eliminating two patterns of life that are totally common outside the church, but should be totally alien inside it. And these patterns of life are assault and withdrawal. And we naturally get assault. I mean, we naturally know just how cutting words can be. You know, I still remember uh, a crack that my seventh grade PE teacher made about a bad haircut, one that I had gotten from a drunk barber. This is, this is true, actually. And I remember I was so humiliated. I was a good kid, but I was so humiliated I marched into the principal's office and I barked an order to whoever was there to call my mom right then because I was out of there, okay? And they did, they called my mom. Mom came and got me and, and, and she fixed my hair. Uh, but the point is, you know, words can crush us. I mean, words can crush us, they can shatter us. We're all like eggs in some ways. And so at Hillside, we should be really careful with our words. We should speak the truth but we should do it with the utmost gentleness. But this is interesting. Dallas Willard also emphasizes that it's not just assault that wounds us, it's also withdrawal. And sometimes we withdraw out of anger. So it's sort of like, I'm mad at you, or you've done something that I don't like, or maybe you're a hillside leader, and I disapprove of a decision you made, something like that. And so I'm going to punish you by disappearing. Some of us grew up in homes like that. And when, when mom or dad uh, were mad at us or mad at each other, they would withdraw emotionally. 
and they would give us the silent treatment. This is not my home, but it's true for some people. And now, because we've had withdrawal modeled for us, we give the silent treatment to those that we're mad at or hacked up. And sometimes, though, we withdraw for another reason, and the reason is shame. And I'm learning. This has been a season of, of new self-awareness for me, especially over the last two and a half years since I've been here. Big learning curve coming here, learning all sorts of things about myself. But one of the things that I've learned about me in the last two and a half years is that my withdrawal trigger is rarely anger. I don't pull back with people because I'm mad at them. When I pull back, it's because I'm feeling bad about me. Shame is my withdrawal trigger. So it's more like this. I feel bad about you. For, or I feel exposed. There's something about you that makes me feel inadequate. And so I will protect myself by hiding. And as a band of spiritual hikers, you know what we should do? We should agree right here and right now. We're going to protect each other in this new season. We're going to protect each other from the bear of church family abandonment. Whatever the trigger happens to be, whether it's anger, something I don't like, or shame, or as we talked about last week, the bear of boredom. And like we also talked about throughout this series, for John, you know, our, our capability for that supercharged love that John is calling us to, which we really need right here at Hillside, it, it's the incarnation. That's our capacity. That's our capability for the supercharged love that John is calling us to, which God is calling us to. And you see, when we believers emboss upon our minds what is the supreme truth of the universe, the ultimate truth of Christianity, the deepest one, the one on which everything else sits like a concrete floor, that the eternal Son of God, God himself, became us. He became a human being, a real human being, and remains so today, to save us from the bear of cosmic evil which was preying upon us, and then to make our new lives possible, our like Jesus in the world lives. When we take that in, when we imprint that in the parchment of our minds, the result is love. It's love. Again, the body of Christ, his physical body, means everything for us, the body of Christ. So will you pray with me right now? Let's pray and let's ask for God to keep doing this. Father, like Randy G., prayed yesterday on the men's hike. Supercharge our love here at Hillside. Supercharge it by your spirit. Our mission, our future depends on our hearts being knit together more fully than they are now. So bind us together in the life laid down love of your son. And help each of us to know what our part in making that happen is. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me read our passage. 1 John 4, 13 through 21. Listen to this. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen... And do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen 
cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must also love their brothers and sisters also. It's God's word for us. I've got a question for you. How many of you sometime over the 4th of July weekend watched Maverick Top Gun? How many of you? I knew there would be. Well, that's from my own son. I expected that. Uh, Tyler. Anyone else? Tyler did. Very good. Uh, uh, I, I, somebody else there. That's good. Uh, Car- is that Carson Anderson? Yes. Very good, Carson. Of course, some of you did. I'm not surprised at all. Because it's a pr- pretty darn good movie. Uh, it was almost safe for the whole family. Okay. And uh, it was free on Amazon, which was sort of the, the recipe for success. And the Sites clan watched it, and I really enjoyed this movie, even though I actually only made it through the first time, uh, through the first 15 minutes of the movie. Uh, And there was a reason for that. I have an incurable case of movie lepsy, okay? It's uh, (laughs) sort of film-inspired narcolepsy. Um, And it does not matter how good or bad the movie is, uh, in 20 minutes, I am out. And it's 10 minutes if we're at the theater and we're in one of those Barco lounger seats, okay? And, and by the way, it's the same with my twin brother, Darren. So it's a genetic thing, not a character flaw, as my wife uh, thinks. But anyway, I was really struck by the setup of this movie. And you know if you've seen it, Maverick, who is working as a test pilot, uh, blows up a supersonic jet after blowing off orders to not go a Mach 10. And after uh, hitting the ground, he's he's frog marched to his commander uh, by a couple of these, you know, burly MP type dudes. And Maverick has every reason to believe that he's going to get kicked out of the Navy and and maybe worse, maybe court-martialed and jailed. But just when the hammer is about to drop, his thieving with contempt commanding officer tells him, that top brass is indeed kicking him off the base, but only so that he can begin a new assignment at Top Gun, his old school. And when the penny finally drops for Maverick that his career is not kaput, he breathes this huge sigh of relief. But then, before he can revel too much in having dodged this bullet of serious punishment, The commander informs him that he's actually not going to Top Gun to fly. He's going to Top Gun to teach. And his face just falls. This is better than being behind bars, but it's definitely not what he wants. So uh, in seconds, Maverick goes from uh, shock to relief to uncertainty. Now, why do I bring that up? Because I think that what Maverick experiences before that board is a little like what we disciples experience before this passage that we just read. Like Maverick, we go from shock to relief to some uncertainty. Think about it. First of all, we hear the phrase day of judgment in verse 17, and we experience a little bit of shock. And let me ask you, when you hear the phrase day of judgment, do you get a little jolt of unpleasant adrenaline like I do? Just a little bit? And regardless of what you know about Christianity, regardless of your your depth of appreciation for Jesus' atoning sacrifice for us, at least for me, when I hear day of judgment, I find myself just getting a, a little bit jarred, even with all that I know. And I kind of think that if we're not a little bit jarred when we read passages like Revelation 20, 11 through 15, with its description of a great white throne and God's presence from which earth and sky have fled away and a great book being opened, and yes, a lake of fire, if we don't feel just a little bit jarred, we might be on too much cold medicine, okay? (laughs) So again, when we hear Day of Judgment in this text, I think we're just, at at first, we're a little like Maverick, just a little bit, in feeling some dread. 
But then we keep reading. And then we notice that right before this reference to the day of judgment is this very important phrase, that we may have boldness. And immediately we breathe a sigh of relief because it's apparent John's not writing this to rattle us. John's writing this to reassure us about this great and quite literally awful day. And here again, we're like Maverick discovering, thank you, Lord, we're not going to be fired or jailed. And then finally, as we keep reading, we reach the last phrase of verse 17, and it's this, because as he is, so are we in this world. And here we experience a little bit of uncertainty. And if we're reading and we're thinking, well, what does that mean? And on the one hand, we're thinking, you know, so great that the point of the passage is assurance. That's fantastic. I'm so glad that's the case. But then we kind of wonder if this assurance is what we want, because it sort of implicitly demands something from us. So once again, we're like Maverick. We're wondering if the news is quite as good as we thought. Now, before we unpack exactly what John says about day of judgment assurance, let's make sure that we understand the day of judgment. Here's a simple definition, maybe especially helpful for somebody who's new uh, investigating Christianity. And that's you. We're so glad you're here. This is a church for spiritually curious people. But this is what the day of judgment is, simple definition. The day of judgment is a future event in which King Jesus appears. New Testament uses that verb a lot, appears. It's like he's here, but not everybody can see him. He appears to crown his people, condemn his enemies, and cleanse creation. Now, someday we're going to go deep into this topic because it's a surprisingly common topic in Scripture. It comes up over and over again. Sometimes we don't see it because we're not expecting it, but it's all over the place. But for now, here are five Day of Judgment factoids, okay? First, the Day of Judgment includes every human being, unbelievers and believers. And it's sometimes thought that only unbelievers will stand before God's throne on the Day of Judgment. That is not the case. Uh, as the many passages that talk about universal judgment make clear. Second factoid. The Day of Judgment involves what we could call a whole enchilada audit of our lives. <laughs> the actions we took, the choices we made, even Jesus says in Matthew 12, the words that we spoke, good and bad. A 360 degree review. Third factoid, here's something more positive. The day of judgment judge will be King Jesus himself. Now this is a tremendous relief to us, right? Because the presiding judge is one that we know right now as leader, teacher, friend, and very importantly, our sin bearer. You know, several years ago, uh, Justin Bieber's pastor tweeted, it was something like this. I tried to find it. I couldn't quite find it, but this is the substance of it. Jesus is not your judge. This was his tweet. Now, I know what this guy meant. He meant, come to faith in Jesus, give him your life and allegiance, and you will not be condemned. And he's absolutely right about that. But King Jesus is definitely your judge. <laughs> He's all of our judge, and more specifically, he will be on the day he appears. Scripture is emphatic about that. Jesus says it of himself in John 5. Fourth factoid. The day of judgment will result in certain vindication, acquittal for all those who are in Christ and walking according to the Spirit. That's Romans 8 in a nutshell. Read Romans 8 and you'll see it. And finally, fifth, and I love this one, the day of judgment will end with a renewed heaven-hugged earth for believing people to enjoy forever in brand new bodies. That's what we're heading for. Now, because of the fourth factoid, we can all breathe a big sigh of relief if we know Jesus. We can, we can rest, all right? Because if we're in Christ and the Spirit, there's no condemnation. The Bible's clear about that. But here's the thing. Sometimes the question still nags at us. How can we be sure? 
How can we be sure that we belong to Christ? How can we be sure that we'll be crowned on the last day? And obviously the Bible recognizes that question in our own minds and hearts because it's giving us a resource for it right here in this passage. Well, the inspired John tells us how. He's very specific about it. He paves a road for us. And let's cut right to the chase. Here, right in our passage, right in the middle of it, John says that the key, or maybe to be a little more precise, the catalyst for last day confidence is abiding in Christ. And then he tells us what abiding in Christ is, or we can kind of build it from other resources in Scripture. Abiding in Christ means all the way from baptism to burial, the whole scope of our Christian lives, all the way coming to Jesus regularly in quiet, Scripture-seasoned, talking and listening. He says that's the way. Now let's walk through this passage and let's see how he develops the thought. First, look back at verses 13 through 15. John says that when the Spirit opens our hearts to believe in Jesus, we begin this brand new life. We begin a new life of abiding in Him and Him in us. That's verses 13 through 15. And he says that God's Spirit comes into us and he opens our minds to something that we can't possibly understand unless he opens our minds to it. And he opens our minds to the reality that Jesus is God's eternal son. And what happens is this new awareness leads to friendship with God, intimate relationship with God, in which, John says, this is very mysterious, God abides in us and we abide in him. And so we're going to call that reciprocal abiding. That's how the Christian life begins. It's a privilege we have belonging to Jesus. We can abide in him and he in us. And then second, John says that as we enjoy this relationship of reciprocal abiding, we linger with Jesus and we experience his love more and more. Our love grows. We become different people. Listen to verse 16. It says, so we have known and believe the love that God has for us. And this is interesting. The verbs known and believe are in the perfect tense here. Thus the have known translation. And as our English teachers like Clay and Shawnee will tell us, perfect verbs, verbs in the perfect tense, indicate action that happened in the past, but has continuing effects into the present. And what John is saying is that our lives of reciprocal abiding lead to an ever-growing experience of, an ever-growing certainty of, God's love for us. It becomes the very bedrock of our souls. And then third, John says, that as we abide and as our love grows, both our love for God and our love for everybody else in the church and out in the world, something else happens. He says that our boldness grows in the face of final judgment. And then he says very specifically in the verse, this is for a particular reason, and it's the result, uh, and it's that the result of that reciprocal abiding which is ours because of the work of the Spirit in our lives, it results in mature love, which results in us being like Jesus in the world. Listen to the verse 17 again. This time I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation because it makes it really, really clear. Listen. He says, And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. It's the Greek word teleos, which we've talked about before and here at different points. It doesn't mean perfect in the sense that we think about it. It means complete well-developed, well-formed. And I'll listen to him go on. He says, so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in the world. So let's draw the threads together so that we can really understand what this passage is telling us and so that we can walk down John's assurance road. This is how it all comes together. According to John here in the passage, the more we abide in Jesus... The more we, as my friend Janet said this morning in our pre-service prayer time, linger with him, to go deep with him, the more love for God matures in us. And more and more, God's love becomes what we are, our essential personhood. The more God's love matures in us, the more we naturally act like Jesus in the world. And finally, the more we act like Jesus in the world, the more day of judgment assurance in the heart 
subjective experience we enjoy. And that's for a very specific reason. It's because we see in our own selves the very purpose for which God sent his son fulfilled in us. Us becoming, in some manner or form, little Christs. You know, not just in spiritual principle, but in actual practice. Of course, we're light years away from perfection, right? We still have a million flaws. But undeniably, we're chips off the old cornerstone, you could say. Informed like that, well, there's just no room left for fear. That's what John is saying. Now, maybe at this point, some of us are having a maverick, you're going to Top Gun to teach moment. And maybe right now we're thinking, you know, I'm glad to have sort of this road to last day assurance that John's talking about, but I'm not sure it's the road that I want. I'm not sure I want this one, but here's the thing. And I think about this all the time, and I've said things like this quite a few times over the last two and a half years. If we think about it really deeply, we really think about our lives, we really think about ultimate reality, and we look around and we see kind of the natural trends among humans as we just sort of observe them. If we think deeply, we discover this is absolutely the kind of assurance that we want, or at least as a complement to other kinds of assurance that the Bible gives us. And other sections of scripture pave other roads for assurance. But what I think is if we think about it really deeply, we want what John is saying here to be true. And think about it this way, returning to Maverick for a moment. Think about how the movie ends. You know, without giving too much away, returning to Top Gun as an instructor turns out to be the best thing that could have ever happened to Maverick. It's the occasion for him to become a much better person, a much more relationally fulfilled person, even though it's the road that he would have never chosen. And it's the same with us. You see, the kind of assurance that John offers us is the assurance we want if we really think it through in our deepest selves. We don't just want assurance that involves looking backwards. The Bible invites us to do that, for sure. It's one of the assurance roads. But we also want assurance that calls us into the future into the wild blue yonder of knowing Jesus more and more and more, into Christ himself, who is love incarnate, so that our love for him can mature, can flower, can grow, and so that we can truly become like him in the world, which is actually our greatest need. I mean, how our lives turn out, whether we are celebrated or people feel a different way at our memorial service, you know what it really depends on more than anything? Certainly not our money, our property, our professional standings. None of that makes any difference. And I've been to a thousand memorial services and I see it very clearly. The only thing that makes a life worth living is a person becoming like Jesus. That's what their family celebrates because they have capacity to love and they do love. The whole success of our lives hinges on us becoming in reality, not just in spiritual principle, like Jesus in the world, though we'll never be perfect ever, 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 ever. So what's the upshot of the passage? John is saying, if we want to experience greater assurance, assurance there are different roads available to us, some which Paul give us, some which other writers give us. This is what he wants to say to us. He says, greater confidence for that great day, if we want it, we should seek to abide ever more deeply, to plunge ever more deeply into Jesus, specifically in, in quiet, personal, scripture-soaked, aware that he's there talking and listening. And this is something we can do. The Spirit has enabled us to do it. This is something that we can call each other to. We can call each other, and we should be doing this as hikers on this great Christ-like quest that we're on together here at New Hillside. We should call each other to abide more deeply. I had coffee with Dan Turnstrom yesterday, one of the real gentlemen of Hillside Covenant Church. We hiked together with the other men. Dan is such a good listener, I dominated the conversation. Sorry, Dan. But you know what I should have done? 
I should have taken at least one moment to say, Dan, are you abiding in Jesus? Keep going, brother. Keep going. We should keep retreating into our secret prayer rooms for conversations with Christ. We should keep reading new books that stimulate love and wonder in Jesus, like Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. And you know what else we should do? We should keep treading down new paths of service, especially to the poor, especially to people who are down and out. You know why? Because judge Jesus in Matthew 25 says, when we minister to the poor, to the least of these, the homeless, the addicted, the imprisoned, we're ministering to him. Isn't that an amazing truth? Jesus is saying something amazing. The hungry, the imprisoned, they're sacraments, according to Jesus. And when we minister to them, we get close, we are at a heaven and earth intersection. <laughs> I didn't make it up, he said it. Let, let's close by making this practical. You know, last Thursday afternoon, I struggled with this message this week. It was hard. I felt like a, a bear, I felt like I was bear wrestling to not overdo a metaphor. But when have I been afraid of overdoing a metaphor? Never, <laughs> never. But I was struggling, trying to fight to make it clear. And in the, in the afternoon, a good friend dropped by my office. And before this person could say anything, I was so happy to see the person. I said, I'm so happy to see you. I'm having a hard time with this message. You can help me <laughs> finish it up. And the friend said, what's the big idea? So I told the friend, according to John, according to John, very specifically, other sections of the Bible say other things, but according to John, the key to last day confidence, the catalyst, Forgetting what is objectively true to sink down deep in our hearts is abiding. In other words, abiding in Jesus, it catalyzes a growth reaction in which we become more like Jesus and the result is confidence. And again, I said, not really the assurance that we might first want. And then I gave her the kind of maverick thing. So I said, we may not want it initially because it kind of feels like maybe it puts a little responsibility on us, but I'm thinking it's really the best kind of assurance because it calls us deeper into Christ. It's an invitation to go forward that complements some of the invitations we have to look back. And when I said this to this friend who is a, somebody close to me, we work closely together as well, somebody I really admire, this person's face fell. And my friend said, I, I just, I really haven't been abiding. My abiding has just been kind of weak, and I find that I'm in a season in which I just want to do everything else <laughs> but quiet myself before the king. I want to go for a walk or watch TV or clean out a closet. I just, for some reason, I want to do anything but coming before Jesus for quiet talking and listening. You know what I said? Being the high and holy pastor that I am and professional Christian, okay, <laughs> I can totally relate. I can relate. You see, sometimes, like the writer of Psalm 42, my soul pants for God's presence. And abiding comes easy. Other times, other times, settling down before God, it almost seems impossible with my mind racing at Mach 10 speed. Especially, I'll tell you, candidly, in this season. It is such an exciting season. There's a lot to do. And when I get into that kind of frantic abiding averse state, here's what I do. It's a very simple practice and it has helped me. And maybe it'll help you when you have your Mach 10 mind moments. Here's what I do. I lock the door and then I put my phone on do not disturb and then I plunk down in my chair and then I set the timer for 15 minutes and I say to Jesus, who I recognize is there with me in the room. I'll say something like this. I'm too scattered to talk. I can't even put two words together. I'm too stressed. I'm too anxious. I'm too fearful. I'm too tired. I might just be too scattered to listen right now. But here's what I'll do. I will sit for silence for 15 minutes with you. And I will be aware of your loving presence for 15 minutes. And then I'll start the timer, and unless there is a zombie attack or a flood, okay, 
I will not move for 15 minutes. I will stay in that chair for 15 minutes. And friends, if in faith I take that 15, even when the world seems, in my own head largely, just sheer noise and chaos, if I take the 15 minutes, I will emerge in a different place. I will emerge with a deep awareness that I have been with the Lord Jesus, my King and friend. And I will emerge with an awareness of him that in that moment grows my love, makes me more capable of doing what God has called me to do, and actually catalyzes my confidence. And I offer that to you because maybe you could try it in your own moments when your head is full of noise and you just can't quiet yourself to listen. God desires that we would be confident in the face of judgment. He doesn't want us fearful. That's what this passage is about. The road to that assurance, according to John, knowing subjectively what is objectively true is ever deeper, abiding in Jesus, who's calling us to him to come and experience his love, the one who is the lover of our souls. Let me pray for us. Father, we believe that through your Son, you have made an atoning sacrifice for us, a once-for-all sacrifice. Still, we can be plagued by doubts that we belong to you. Thanks for the assurance road you've paved for us in this inspired book, one that invites us deeper and deeper into your son, our friend, our king, who died for us. And Father, help us to do it when we feel like it. Help us to abide when we don't. Help us to call each other to abide deeply in your son. Move us by your spirit to abide this week so that your love can come to greater fruition in us and so that our families and our workplaces and our church and our neighbors can experience something of your son in their midst, which is why you died for us, to renew us, to make us the humans you imagined you, we would be when you created this world and you placed us on it. Thank you so much. Thanks for the hope we have. Thanks for the confidence we have. Thanks for the blessed assurance we have. A new road for it we've learned this week. We love you. We thank you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.